I'm here because, um, as someone who's been uh, trying to break difficult stories into the mainstream for over a decade, as many are trying to do, um, you know, and and you know, flirting with the mainstream media, I've seen firsthand the limitations, the problems, deficiencies, the structural uh, issues, um, and myself experienced censorship at the Guardian in a very direct way. Um, so I see the kind of initiatives that are being spoken about here at the Real Media Conference as really integral to any kind of effort to create meaningful social movements that can challenge power and begin to create a real democracy um, that actually means something to, 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 you know, to the people that it should be uh, kind of representing. So for, for me, information is, is, is the, uh, is I think the fundamental kind of first step. Um, it's about once you're able to kind of leverage people's ideas and help them to think outside the box, you open up the opportunity for change. But until people are, you know, until they, until they're able to look outside of that box, it's very difficult. People don't understand even why there is something wrong with, with the way things are however much they might be suffering. So I think something like Real, Real Media, which is bringing together you know, you know, people who are a wide range of people pioneering very different forms of activism and media in, in different kinds of, you know, whether it's in terms of visual or audio or they're doing stuff, which is, you know, they're writing, they're blogging. Um, I think it's important that we actually join forces, come together and start talking to each other about how we can actually work together to create uh, and empower each other in creating uh, an alternative media which actually is does represent people and actually represents their interests and investigates issues in, in, in a in a kind of meaningful way. So that for me, you know, being part of this is just uh, is is part is is part of doing what you know what, what in terms of real journalism. I feel that this is the kind of thing a journalist should be doing more, getting involved in real kind of grassroots movements. And um, do you, are you feeling there's like a loss of them thing going on then? That, that that because of your experience at the Guardian, you know you were. Cause a lot of people might see the Guardian as one of us, but are you saying that the Guardian is really one of them? I think with the problem with the Guardian is that yes, it is on the liberal end of the spectrum. Yes, a lot of its coverage is far more exemplary than many of the other elements of the British press. But the problem is it's still part of a spectrum of power. Um, I mean, The Guardian often makes a big hullabaloo about how it's owned by a trust. Um, and, you know, the trust is there to protect its editorial independence. And we're so different to the ownership of media moguls like Rupert Murdoch. But when you actually look at this so-called trust, it's not a trust. It was a trust when it was set up in the 1930s. But in 2008, they transitioned it into a, a, a limited company. So it's actually not the Scott Trust, it's the Scott Trust Limited. But you never see on the Guardian pages it referred to as the Scott Trust Limited, and that's not an accident. If you look at the people who are on the board of the Scott Trust Limited, you know, you have some former journalists and former Guardian people, but then you also have people like Anthony Sowles, who is a senior investment banker at Rothschild. You have other corporate lawyers, and, and, and you have people of that kind of ilk. Um, and if you look at the Guardian Media Group, which is owned by the Scott Trust. Again, you know, the executives on there are people who represent uh, highest levels of British society from politics, banking, law, finance, you know, you name it, it's, it's, it's there represented. So I think we have to recognise that there are these structural problems and, the, and, and that's why The Guardian also does suffer from, from, from limitations and failings. And in my case, I wrote a story about um, you know, I was writing for the environment section of The Guardian and I was commissioned to write about the geopolitics of environmental and energy issues and I wrote a piece on Gaza and was talking about Operation Protective Edge and the increasing role of Gaza's gas in motivating Israeli military operations. And the day after I posted that under my contract, I had editorial control over what I, of what I wrote and I had the ability to post straight to the site and I hadn't had any problems in the past before and had been writing for about a year or so and literally the day after writing that piece and putting it up and it started to go viral immediately I was called by an editor who told me that 
um, it was not a proper environment story. Um, even though I'd been writing about gas and oil and, and conflict, you know, for the last year, it was not a proper environment story, I'm going to terminate your blog. Um, and that was it, terminate my contract, terminate my blog, boom. So that's, that kind of experience um, made me see um, quite clearly um, how Orwellian, you know, our, our media can be. When you have, um, you know, an institution like The Guardian, which is widely seen, and not unjustifiably so, as pioneering some very solid journalism, you know, they broke the NSA uh, Snowden stories, you know, they have done some good journalism. To have a, a publication like that, to be able to conduct this kind of censorship, and then when I went public about it, and you know, the, the, the stuff I talked about did go viral, even though this is a statement from The Guardian, basically reiterating the same kind of ridiculous excuse. It wasn't an environment story. And you know, Jonathan Friedland came out because I had named him as uh, a, an editor who had been outed by other journalists inside The Guardian on condition of anonymity as, as being someone who had a heavy influence on its coverage of Gaza. Um, and would attempt to limit discourse in some ways. Now, all of this came out and, and, and it made a big hullabaloo, but not a single other publication in the uh, media covered the story or mentioned it. You know, even the Index on Censorship, um, which happens to have some funding from The Guardian for one of its awards on freedom of, of expression, didn't want to cover it, but I know for a fact that they were aware of, of what had happened to me. Um, that kind of thing tells us about the state of our media um, in general and, and, and shows that behind the scenes of this kind of uh, in a facade of a, of a free press, actually there are these very insidious forces at work. So can, can you, if we're taking this as an example of that particular story, what do you think the motivation was for, for Axel and you? It's difficult to say. Uh, and with this kind of thing, you know, it's, uh, you know I had to, I speculated, uh, you know, you know, about various possibilities. I asked around, I spoke to journalists inside and outside The Guardian, a couple of senior editors who'd written for The Guardian. And generally the overall impression I got was that the reason The Guardian did this was not because there was outside lobbying or something like that, but purely because The Guardian as a, as a culture, um, since its founding, has had a very pro-Israel, pro-Zionist um, kind of approach. And actually, the, the, this has actually been documented in um, a number of uh, histories of The Guardian, where they've explored how uh, Guardian, the Guardian editorially has got, sometimes gone to great pains, despite its criticism of Israel, to ensure that it doesn't go too far. And, 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 to, uh, and in fact, that's something that, it, that, 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 it, that it's proud of, that it's, uh, it, it works hard to protect the integrity of Israel. Um, and of course, there is, in, in, in terms of ethics, in terms of integrity, it's very important that, you know, Israel or Palestine or whatever is not unjustly demonized or unjustly um, kind of slandered or whatever. But that shouldn't close um, legitimate journalism which exposes corruption or exposes um, the problematic interests. So what I could see going on here was that somehow, and to this day it's somewhat of a mystery, somehow by writing this article, linking up um, conflict in the Middle East, specifically in Palestine, with environment issues and energy issues, I had crossed some kind of invisible barrier. I had done something that shouldn't be done on the environment site and doesn't belong on the opinion section in Comment is Free um, and doesn't belong anywhere in The Guardian. Somehow doing that kind of join the dots investigation just wasn't the right thing to do. And to this day, I mean, literally Alan Rusbridger responded just the other day to one of the delegates here at Real Media, Samantha, who was complaining, have you read this, um, this, this explanation that he's written about the way he was treated? You know, so far your statement doesn't make sense. You know, why you know, engage with this? And his response on Twitter was, read this statement. Uh, the blog wasn't pulled. But that was it. And, and on the statement it just says, this was not a proper environment story and we had to stop it. Well, now that you're not doing that block yeah. of The Guardian, you can tell us something about what you're doing now. Yeah, so since leaving The Guardian, um, my interest in um, finding ways to make journalism independent and more kind of accountable to people has just grown exponentially, obviously because it's experienced me personally, and now for me it's a case of how do I sustain 
independent investigative journalism um, without being co-opted in that way. And it was a bit, it was a, a struggle and a dilemma to find a way of doing it. But I, I've kind of positioned myself by um, securing two columns at some reasonably mainstream publications. I write for Vice, uh, but I write for their tech publication, Motherboard, which doesn't have a massive readership, but editorially there's a lot more scope to write about the things I'd like to write about. I also have a column for Middle East Diet, um, which is a small digital publication, incidentally founded by an ex-Guardian editor, David Hurst. So they're both good publications, quality journalism. Um, you know, they don't pay massively, but it's just enough. What keeps me going is the crowdfunding. So I went to a site called patreon.com, where they have an interesting model where people can pay either per created piece or they pay per month. And so I set up a subscription model where people would pay per month. And what they would be doing is not paying to have an exclusive thing that only they would read, but paying to, to, to me to be able to do journalism that everyone can read. And it's a really interesting model because it's allowed me to raise something like now $2,000 per month to sustain that. Um, and that's allowed me to pursue investigations that I wasn't able to do even when I was writing for The Guardian. You know, so I've been doing long, you know, long form stories, which you know, are pretty hard hitting, pretty important, I think. I did a story on Google and the NSA and the CIA, which went viral, hasn't made any mainstream dent whatsoever, except maybe one or two small tech publications. But now, th this is interesting, because this is a story that Google, when it was founded, received funding from American uh, secret services. That's right, yeah. So I um, ended up getting confirmation from um, uh, and someone who's an academic now. She's a professor at the University of Texas. She heads up the Cybersecurity Research Institute there. Her name is uh, Professor Theresingham. And uh, she basically told me um, that when she was working for a defense contractor called Mitra, she managed a program called the Massive Digital Data Systems Initiative which was all about funding innovative new big data projects and data mining, all that kind of stuff. And they gave a packet of money to Stanford University in, around the 1990s. And part of that funding went through a guy called Professor Jeffrey Ullman at Stanford. And one of his students was, um, uh, well, two of his students were the founders of Google, including Sergey Brin. Now, Sergey Brin actually received some of that funding and he would meet regularly every three months with Professor Theresingham and a guy called Rick Steinheiser who was an active CIA official at that time and he would regularly brief them on the progress of his research. Now the thing is there's nothing actually necessarily sinister about this um, in the sense that we know that this, the intelligence community was all over that kind of funding. What makes it sinister is the fact that Google, Google basically denied it and have denied it to this day. Um, and when I asked them specifically about, I mean, they just issued kind of like no comment or this is not true. When I asked them specifically, but okay, but can you confirm whether Sergey Brin was funded by this massive data digital systems initiative, which was an intelligence community initiative, can you confirm that you, he was meeting with Rick Steinheiser, who was a CIA official, very regularly in that two year period, 1996 to 1998, until the incorporation of Google? Um, and they just didn't respond. People now ac seem to accept, particularly after this uh, Snowden release and all that, people accept that they are surveilled, all of their electronic communication is constantly surveilled. Is, that, is this something that we should be a bit more actively opposing, that our privacy simply doesn't exist digitally? We should be actively opposing it, and the reason for that is, is that so mass surveillance, even though it's been touted as a security issue, has nothing to do with national security in the real sense of protecting public safety. There's not a single shred of evidence that has been put out by security services, despite all of the opportunity. I mean, we've had, what, 20 years now of war, of, of war constant war, and, and in the last few de decade in particular, you know, this Islamist terrorism threat and all the rest of it, and all manner of other issues. But we have not had a single compelling case where surveillance in that sense has actually demonstrably stopped a terrorist attack. Um, and experts who talk about NSA surveillance will talk about and confirm that 
you know, independent experts, cybersecurity experts will say that the problem is, is that you're dealing with a huge amount of information and, we t and, and it's just like looking for a needle in the haystack. So you've got all of this stuff that's coming in, but you won't be able to process it. And that's the problem. What, it's, what this is actually about, it's about control. It's about having massive control of information and being able to track dissent and political dissent. And in fact, actually, Bruce Schneier, who is a, an American cybersecurity expert who was working with Greenwald and, uh, you know, in terms of the Snowden revelations, he wrote a lot about it for The Guardian, incidentally. He has pointed out that it's, protect, it's, it's detecting dissent and detecting organizations that could challenge the status quo, challenge big business, challenge, you know, these injustices, the incestuous relationships, that is that, that it's useful for you know using these algorithms and stuff that's what it's good at doing not so good at actually finding real terrorists how should people go about finding out better getting better quality information i think it, it, it's uh, it's a challenge because i think you know we're faced with this kind of farcical parade of personalities with the way politics is presented and as we've heard at the conference you know the real issues aren't being discussed i think the best thing people can do is to is to be skeptical of the way in which things are being framed not to kind of fall for the trap of I'm going to watch you know the big debates between the party leaders and think that's going to actually mean that much we need to look at the real issues and not let it be about personalities and look at what are the policies what are the issues to do with inequality how are they going to deal with finance what are these guys doing about the banks and I think that's a place where alternative media and there's a huge amount of credible, solidly researched, you know, well-investigated information that is being put out by independent journalists and even some mainstream journalists who are, you know, sceptical of, of, of the way things are going and, and even within their institutions do put out good stuff. I think what we need to do is be able to is find ways to bring this kind of information together and disseminate it in the run-up to the election to as many people as possible, especially young people. Because right now I think there is this problem where we have um, a skewered voting structure where a certain type of population is voting and you know most young people aren't but people who are already fairly well off middle class or you know older generation are more likely to vote so we have effectively a, a very unrepresentative democracy and are you personally involved in anything in the run-up to the election do you write in any stories or can we expect to see your name on anything well, you know, it's like this. I mean, at the moment, I've got so many different stories on the go, you know, but I'm, I'm working on a big corruption story about HSBC and its domestic impact and how HSBC has been defrauding people domestically and how the entire media has just completely covered it up while saying, wait, you know, look how great we are. We covered the Swiss leaks, which aren't going to affect HSBC's operations here. Also looking at stuff to do with um, the way the police has been dealing with activists um, effectively shilling for fossil fuel corporations and the kind of incestuous relationship that that implies for the political establishment and these kinds of large big business companies. So that's the kind of stuff I'm looking at in the run-up to the elections. I mean, I don't, I don't see the elections necessarily producing um, a result that we might want to see, but I think it's important that people do engage in the electoral process rather than letting it be hijacked by these interests.